Good evening or morning, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Allison Letourneau, and I am the Associate Head of School for Enrollment here at the White Mountain School. Thank you for being with us tonight. Exciting news to share. You are a part of history tonight at the White Mountain School. We have record attendance this evening. This event has attracted more prospective students and families than any in-person or virtual event ever held by the school. I'm really excited and proud to share with you tonight what makes White Mountain School a unique place to which our students and faculty are deeply drawn and connected. So before I turn things over to the main event, which is fortunately not me, I'd like to offer a few pieces of advice and a few thoughts. First, a few thoughts. It's hard to capture my thoughts these days without stating the obvious. The world is heavy right now. There's a lot to contemplate and navigate. There are voices to be heard, actions to take, and systems to disrupt. We're in the midst of an important and long overdue reckoning on race in this country. We are fighting a pervasive and dangerous global pandemic, and we're approaching an incredibly contentious election. Things are not easy, and for some, they have never been. I also want to acknowledge that in hearing from our students and faculty this evening, you will likely hear about the in-person learning experiences they have been having for the past few months. An experience that has quickly and sadly become a rarity or impossibility for so many in this country and across the world. Many students have not had an opportunity to step foot in a classroom since March. Perhaps that includes some of you on the call tonight. We do want to take a moment to name and recognize the privilege we have to be in person in a location in the country that has low rates of infection and on our spacious and expansive campus in rural New Hampshire. With all of this said, there is great opportunity ahead. At the White Mountain School, we believe that the world needs you, our students, to be change makers. We need your leadership, your voice, your perspective, your ideas. We need you to help us shape the world in which we wanna live. Perspective students on the call tonight, I'm speaking to you. This is an exciting moment in your lives. The start of a search for your next school, an experience that can transform you for the rest of your life. As you approach our event tonight and your search process as a whole, I thought I'd leave you with three important pieces of advice and I hope you find them helpful. I share these through the lens of having attended a boarding school myself and having worked in them for over a decade. My first piece of advice is to reflect. Take time to reflect on your most recent years and identify in those most recent years, moments in your life, whether at school or otherwise, when you felt most empowered, engaged, and connected. Then take it another step and ask yourself, what was it about those moments that created the conditions for you to feel that way? You can gain a lot by thinking about what from those moments, whether it was a strong relationship or a specific teaching style, were important to you feeling alive. Look for them in your search and in various schools. The second piece of advice is to inquire, ask questions. Specifically, I think one of the most important questions you can ask when searching for a boarding school is about time. What do I mean by that? Be sure to ask schools about how they spend their time by asking about a school's schedule. In independent schools, schedules are often a proxy for values. As independent schools, we have the freedom to create our own schedules and we often allocate time based on our values. How many classes are offered a day? Is there passing time? Are classes long allowing for deep project-based learning or are they short and more lectured-based? Do competitive athletics drive the schedule? Is that important to you? Is there time for community? How does a school value community? And do they value it enough to create time and space in their schedule for it? The third piece of advice is to embrace this process. The school search process can easily feel overwhelming, perhaps especially during a pandemic. But this is an opportunity. 
If you choose to embrace this experience and process, you will learn so much about yourself, your values, and what's important to you. Don't miss an opportunity to learn important lessons about yourself during this process. Additionally, and in a world where there is so much uncertainty right now, this search process can be a way to retain a sense of control over your present situation and your exciting future ahead. This is your search, your experience, and your future. So throughout the program this evening, we'll focus on connecting you to what we believe really matters when searching for a school and what can uncover for you some of the answers to your questions. The people. Fun fact, it's actually not the beautiful buildings on a campus that makes a school the right fit for you. It's the people. A wise student once said to me in an interview, Allison, I'm not searching for a school. I'm searching for a community. So without further ado, thank you for being with us here tonight. We're excited that you're here. We're excited that you've taken the step to learn more about the White Mountain School. And I'm gonna turn it over now to our Director of Admission and Financial Aid, Peter Wickman, and our incredible students and faculty. Thank you so much, Allison. Uh, if everyone can bear with me for one moment, I'm gonna start to pull over our amazing panelists. All right, I think I have everyone. So uh, I wanna kick things off with some brief introductions. I think that it's really important, as Allison mentioned, to get a sense of who we are, um, who these people that make up the White Mountain School are this evening. Um, I will, will kick things off. My name is Peter Wickman. I'm the Director of Admission and Financial Aid. I work closely in the admissions office with Allison, uh, and also you may have uh, connected with Cindy and Ashley. Um, I grew up in New Jersey and, and am so grateful that I found uh, this, this amazing place up here in the mountains of New Hampshire. Um, one thing that I want to share and that I will ask all of our panelists to share is something that excites me about the White Mountain School. For me, it's that we're informal. Um, we are a, a traditional New England boarding school, which has a lot of stereotypes that tie together formality with success. And I have witnessed so many amazing students, so many amazing colleagues and, and teachers um, be successful and be their authentic selves without feeling that the necessity to, to be informal. Um, I also don't like wearing a tie that much, um, but enough for me. I'm going to kick it around to the rest of our panelists. Um, Annie, would you mind introducing yourself? Hi, my name is Annie Paulson. I am a junior at the White Mountain School. This is my second year here. Um, I'm from Keene, New Hampshire, and I'm also a third generation member of the White Mountain School. And one thing that excites me about the school is the learning and the way that the classroom and teaching works. It's very different from what I am used to learning in like public schools. It's definitely more engaging and with like smaller class sizes and all, it's definitely more hands-on and a better learning experience for me personally, which I really like about the school. Thank you, Annie. Kara? Hi, I'm Kara Wiley and I teach physics and biology here at White Mountain School. I'm also a dorm parent. 
Um, I come from Florida originally, but have been working um, in international schools overseas in Chile and uh, Taiwan and the United Arab Emirates for the last 20 years. So New Hampshire is my home now. Um, and the thing that excites me most probably about the White Mountain School is how so much of what happens here is student driven from projects and activities that are taking place in the classroom to um, activities on the weekends and clubs and groups that are forming, the students initiate so much of this and it empowers them. Um, it excites them about being here. And I feel it also is giving them really valuable leadership skills for the future. Thank you, Kara. Oliver. Hi, I'm Oliver and I'm a three-year junior at White Mountain. I'm from Orinda, California. And something that excites me about White Mountain is just being able to live with all of my best friends and like hang out with them and do all the activities that we love. Perfect. Thanks, Oliver. Matthew? <clears throat> Hi, my name is Matthew Williams. Um, I teach English here. This is my first year at the White Mountain School. I'm originally from Philadelphia, but have been working in New England for a couple of years. And the thing that um, excites me the most about the White Mountain School is, and I will echo um, Kira's sentiments, the student-centered approach um, to, to learning and engagement. That, that is something that's really special. Thank you, Matthew. Jamie? Um, hi, my name is Jamie. I'm from uh, Lusaka, Zambia. And um, I'm a sophomore at the White Mountain School. This is my second year here. And something that excites me about the White Mountain School is basically the community feel, how I can be like with all the people that I feel close to all the time and also like how nice everyone is. Thanks, Jamie. Dinah? Hi, my name is Dinah Gray and I direct the dance program here. This is the beginning of my third year. Um, I'm originally from Los Angeles, California. Um, one thing, there are several, but one thing that really excites me about being here is that it's really a place for our family. My husband is also on faculty here and we have a daughter who's a junior and um, it's been wonderful to see, it's been wonderful in ways we couldn't have predicted for her um, with the friends she's made and what she's been able to pursue since she's been here. Thank you, Dinah. Brian. All right, hi, uh, I'm Brian Flores. I'm a sophomore at WMS. Uh, roles that I have here on campus include equity and inclusion delegate, uh, citizenship committee, current events leader, White Mountain Scholars mentor, National Honor Society member, uh, and an admissions ambassador. Uh, and I'm from Red Bank, New Jersey. And with that comes like one of my favorite parts about this school is just the diversity that there is both internationally and in the States. So there's like different backgrounds from everywhere, you get different perspectives. And with that comes different stories that you can share. And it's just nice to see how lively it is here every day at WMS. Thanks, Brian. Mike? It's like, it's my first time on Zoom. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, my name is Mike Peller. I'm the assistant head for teaching and learning. And this is my third year at the White Mountain School. I have almost forever lived at boarding schools. I grew up on one. Uh, my parents were both teachers. Uh, I was drawn to this school for its commitment to um, student-driven inquiry. And I hate to be a broken record, but the thing that I love about it and what, what excites me every day is how much student choice there is in learning. I'm hearing from teachers and students about the ambitious projects that kids are that they're tackling. Um, it, it is just so exciting. Uh, and then second, just to reiterate what Allison said at the beginning when she said there are actions to take and systems to disrupt. I love how unapologetic we are in our commitment to social justice and environmental sustainability. Um, it is not something that lives on the outside of our curriculum, but it's absolutely central in everything that we're doing. Um, we are truly um, both educating and inspiring our students to be change makers in a world that needs healing right now. Thanks so much, Mike. So to our attendees, thank you to those of you that pre-submitted questions. Um, what we're going to do now is I've organized a couple of them. I will kick them out to some of our panelists so that you can hear their perspectives on them. Um, you also have the opportunity throughout this webinar 
to use the Q&A box. So if something that um, someone has already said, or if something that someone says uh, during this presentation sparks a question in you, um, please do type it into the Q&A box and I'll make sure to, to get to it before we wrap up. Um, so without further ado, one of the first questions that I think would be relevant for this group is um, a question came in, how do you support new students as they transition into your community? Um, Brian, uh, I'd love for you to take a crack at this first. All right, yeah, so we support new students usually with like pairing them with either ambassadors or close friends that they may have connections to uh, in the school. So it's like more comfortable and it's like an easy adjustment period for them. But with that, there's also advisors. Every student has an advisor and is like their go-to person if you have questions about living in dorms or just need something off campus that you can't have, uh, you can always go to them. And advisors will like frequently check on new students just to make sure that they're fitting in and everything's going smoothly in dorms. And if there's ever like a problem uh, regarding dorming, you can always like ask to be moved out or if you're missing, I don't know, shampoo or something in dorms, you can ask your advisor to go off campus for you because at this moment, it's not very possible for students go out. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of different people that you can go to here who will always like support you in like any way possible. And I think that's like really one of the good things about this place. It's like you're kind of you're seen as like a person and then you're kind of given, I guess, your freedom to do to ask questions. And like if you need assistance, it's there for you. It's not like you have to go seek it out for yourself. Like there was always going to be someone to check on you. Thanks, Brian. And Dinah, I'm going to call on you as well, because I do think it's wonderful that you have had the opportunity to see this, um, this experience, the onboarding of new students, both as a faculty member and also as a parent. Yeah, I would say it's kind of like the, the mirror image to what um, Brian was just saying. I feel like um, the adults in this community are just amazingly committed to not letting any kids fall through the cracks. Um, and so there's so much attention to um, making sure that that initial transition is smooth for kids. And if something seems like nothing could be wrong yet, but if something seems like, oh, this seems like slightly concerning, there's adults who are, who are focused on that from the, from the very beginning. Um, and then other people have mentioned, like Jamie mentioned, everybody being kind here. Um, that's just such a huge um, boon to a new student is being in a place where people say hello to each other, even if they don't necessarily know each other yet. Um, and so it makes that, um, that onboarding process very authentic and natural. Perfect, thank you. Um, I will pause and just say I've received a couple questions already, which is wonderful. Um, the questions about specific numbers, um, I'll make sure to, to answer those at the end. They'll be pretty quick and easy. Um, the next question that we have is about outdoor education and what opportunities exist for outdoor education here at White Mountain. Um, Oliver, do you want to take a crack at that one first? Yeah, I'd love to. Um... So we have an amazing outdoor education program here. Uh, there's a class that is taught that is actually outdoor education and you focus on learning how to lead groups in the outdoors and plan trips and basically everything related to outdoor activities and leading those. And we also have a lot of outdoor sports so like rock climbing, whitewater kayaking, um, like cross country, stuff like that. And yeah, it's a, it's a really great program for learning outdoor, yeah. Mike, I'm wondering if you would mind talking a little bit as well about how that fits into the academic program. Sure, yeah, and let me give a little bit of additional context. Thank you, Oliver, for, for that. Um, there's also a handful of courses, um, for example, our sustainable farming class where 
students are spending half the time researching sort of aspects of, of uh, small scale agriculture, but the other half of the time they're on our farm, uh, hands in the soil, uh, participating in planting in our hoop house. Um, we also have um, our, you know, maybe I'll just turn this over to Kara because I think Kara, you could give one of the most amazing examples uh, recently. So in a number of opportunities, uh, we're taking kids off campus for place-based education. Uh, Kara, who's a biology teacher was looking, um, What? Let, I'll let you explain it, Kara. So we're right now studying ecology and the students have planned some, some way amazing projects. Um, we were looking at population counts. And so we had students that designed um, using a quadrant sampling method. They were out on campus trying to estimate the number of pine trees we have here or the number of ferns. Um, we had two groups that wanted to estimate the number of fish in the pond. And that turned into a huge project where students that weren't even in biology class we're out at the pond with us trying to, to mark and recapture fish. Um, and then the next project we're doing, we're hoping to actually go off campus and take water samples from some of the different lakes around, soil samples from some of the different farms around to see how human influence is impacting um, our abiotic environment. And, and I would, thanks, Kara, sorry to interrupt. And I, I would add too, in our field courses, which are week long immersive courses, a, a number of them are focused on uh, place-based outdoor education. One example is looking at avalanche science and, and students um, go and learn about uh, the science of avalanches and as well as learn to backcountry ski. Um, there's another course that's looking at geology uh, and travel out west and do some climbing as well. Uh, and so we want students to both through and their own kind of deep personal experience with place, develop a love for it and through that love for it, develop the habit of stewarding natural spaces. Amazing, uh, thank you all. We've received a couple questions about um, both grade level uh, numbers, so I'll answer those, and then also about how students interact. So one of the questions was how many new sophomores do we take in each year? Um, and how do we feel that they, that they integrate? Um, I'll give you a breakdown of our numbers. Um, we have 140 students. Um, typically our ninth grade class is um, between 25 and 30 students. And then in 10th and 11th grade, we'll have in the 35-ish uh, range students. And then typically our 12th grade class will climb close to 40. Um, so we are adding in each grade level. Um, however, the largest entering class of course is ninth graders. Um, with regard to how new students at a variety of entry points um, integrate with one another and connect with one another. Um, Annie, do you wanna talk a little bit about getting to know kids from other grades? Of course, yeah. Um, last year was my first year at WMS and I came in as a sophomore and I definitely came in a little worried because I had missed the freshman year and I thought I was gonna like miss out on making all the friends in my grade and that was, so far from the truth I came in and everyone's very welcoming and not only do you make friends in your own grade there's always new people in your grade but the way that um WMS we do like a lot of different activities that involve different grades like you'll be in your sports with different grades sometimes you'll have classes with people who are older than you or younger than you um when we do like our field courses where we go off campus and learn about like and we like do learning outdoors for a week, you'll be with a random group and they're not, it's never like specific to your own grade. And then again, you'll be living in a dorm with people who are older or younger than you. So there's a lot of integration between different grades. And I think it's really nice because I definitely came in thinking I was only gonna like be friends with people who are in my grade and my friend group expands through all the different ages and I'm, it really doesn't matter whether or not you're a junior or a freshman, everyone's friends with anyone doesn't, grade doesn't really matter here. Thanks, thanks Annie. Um, and Jamie, I'll ask you to add just a little bit because of course I saw you all day on, um, was that Monday with, uh, with Leah? So tell me a little bit about your friend group and, and how you all got to know one another, please. Uh this is Leah. She's my roommate. She's a senior. Wait, can you see me? Yes. 
<laughs> so um basically my friend group is like with older people and younger people too but mostly older people and i and um it really doesn't matter what grade you're in because like you can connect with different kinds of people and um it doesn't like age or like grade it doesn't all matter anyone can be friends with anyone basically thanks jamie um we had a couple questions that were pre-submitted about diversity here at the White Mountain School. Um, so, uh, Matthew, would you mind speaking a little bit to what you've seen uh, so far at White Mountain, both um, how this, the school supports diversity and also, um, you know, any interactions that you have um, seen or felt? Absolutely. Um... I could, I could talk about it through two ways, one being in the classroom and then one being outside of the classroom. Um, I think the thing that struck me the, the most when it came to diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives here is that the White Mountain School didn't want to do diversity just for the sake of doing it. It was really with care and intention. It wasn't a buzzword. It wasn't a fad. It was recognizing that we really do have a diverse student population and the intention of making sure that every student has a space and an opportunity to see themselves reflected in the curriculum and to allow space for them to bring in their narratives, their background, and, and their stories. And so in the classroom, we, we have such diverse text. Um, we, we create spaces for students to have window and, and mirror experiences through, through you know, project-based learning and, and allowing them to lead the conversation and to do projects that interest them and that are important to them. Um, in one of my classes, uh, we focus a lot on social justice and real world issues. And so thinking about the ways in which the real world is directly impacting students here and how they can think about these lens through an academic um, lens and then taking what they learn and potentially trying to create ways to solve these issues in the real world. So it's a lot of back and forth between what's happening in the classroom and, and the real world issues that are affecting our students. I would say outside of the classroom, we are equally doing just as much and making sure that our students are put first. So last weekend, um, I organized a uh, student of color um, dinner for a young men on campus. And it was just an amazing space to have students there and just being in fellowship and, and laughing and eating pizza and, and just being in a space where they could interact with each other and not have the pressure of constantly having to be a student. Um, and then likewise, we're also having another space for our um, female identifying students who identify as students of color to, to share that same experience. And so I think for me, what has been amazing about this place is this work is not being done just to tokenize or because it's the hip thing to do. It really is an investment. And, and you see that not just in the classes that are offered, but in the way in which we genuinely try and connect and, and support our students in, in every facet of their existence here. Thank you, Matthew. And Brian, you had alluded to our social justice delegates. Do you mind expanding on that a little bit? Uh, yeah, sure. So last year, we kind of made the collective decision to have the uh, student, students, uh, student delegates for equity and inclusion, because we felt the need that it was necessary to have on this campus. Instead of having like talks about it, we actually want to have like a, a set group in place to have these like weekly discussions about what's going on in the country or what's going on on campus to see what social issues we can address uh, and then find solutions to. Uh, and with that, we also want Kimberly, one of the directors of uh, Equity and Inclusion, uh, implemented the social justice seminars for all grades this year. So everybody has the knowledge and becomes more open minded through these discussions about what life can be like on campus for students of color or in the country in general. And we're doing a very good job at being progressive. And we're, as Matthew said, we're not just doing this to be hip or it's a cool thing to do but we actually feel the need that it creates an open environment for all students, regardless of like what you identify as. Uh, and I feel like that's very important. And that's why I really like this, this space where we can all just kind of be ourselves and address issues that we feel the need to talk about. Thanks, Brian. 
Um, we've had a couple questions come in about, um, about scheduling and classes. Um, so the most direct, and, and Mike, I'll kick these to you first. Um, the most direct is what is the day-to-day -day schedule like? Are there Saturday classes? And what is the usual work, um, workload like? Well, maybe I can, I'll answer in terms of um, what it has been and what, what response we've done this year, but I would love to hear, have students sort of describe the workload and, and the lived experience. Um, typically, we have, we have six academic blocks that are year long that, that rotate on a modified block. So you have either three or four classes meeting each day, which means that you are preparing at home for homework for three or four classes the following day. Um, we, we made a very um, big and important decision as a response to COVID to make sure that um, as we went into this year, given the unpredictability of the year, uh, that we could um, try to create a system that would allow students to have less to, less to manage at a time. Uh, so rather than taking six courses or over the course of a year, um, students are taking two or three courses in a semester. Um, so it's a much more deep dive. Uh, but what it means is that a student is only having to sort of juggle between two or three classes in a given week uh, and, and knowing that, you know, if we were to have to go to remote uh, and, and that, that can be a challenge to do with many classes to juggle, it's a, it's a simpler system. Um, I, I will say we, are, we have a task force of, of faculty that are assessing this right now and, and, and kind of doing the research to think about next year, are there aspects of this current schedule that we would want to incorporate or not? Um, so that's, that's what's going on right now. I mean, it's an, it's an interesting year, of course, to talk about like what's normal because so much is not. Um, but maybe, Pete, I'll throw it back to you to, to ask some of the students what the, what the lived experience is like for a student. Yeah. Um, Oliver, why don't you talk about what your day-to-day -day is like? And maybe you could talk um, a little bit about this year um, as we have made some changes, um, but also think back to last year. Yeah, so um, in terms of like class time, we we have like a different schedule this year. So we have like, I think it's like an hour of like normal class. And then we have like a flex block where we're doing like homework for that class and like, but we're still in the classroom so we can like ask the teacher if we need help on an assignment, which is super nice because like, uh, a lot of students know that like if you're doing a homework assignment at home and you don't know what to do like it's hard to get help but if you're in the classroom while you're doing that homework assignment it's super helpful like in especially for getting started on it um and like last year we didn't have that but you could still get help from teachers like outside of class because a lot of the faculty live on campus and they're your dorm parents and they're always around and they're almost always willing to help you if you're in need of help. Like you can go to them when they're on duty. Um, like when I was a freshman, I'd walk up to Burroughs and get help from the science teacher on my science projects. Um, yeah, it's, it's a super helpful and like supportive system. Perfect. Thanks so much, Oliver. Um, we have a couple questions that are surrounding uh, grades. Um, the first couple questions are sort of about how students earn grades um, and how they how they get grades. Um, and then the second questions are about um, what our outcomes are like, um, how students are able to use their experience to build a profile for college applications. Um, Dinah, do you want to kick things off and talk about grades, um, you know, both as a faculty member and as a parent? Yeah, so um, we're in a really kind of um, interesting place right now in that some of our faculty um, have been adopting um, a different grading system, a competency-based um, grading system. Um, the the concepts that sort of are part of that system are across the whole faculty, but um, it's sort of a, a different way to look at assessing work where um, it's not a straight, you know, you turned in a paper and we're going to give you an 85 on it. It's much more detailed and it allows the teacher to um, very um, sort of directly 
address those base competencies, communication, um, quantitative reasoning, there's, there's several of them. Um, I've found that um, as a parent, it helps to, it, it helps uh, my student to sort of, it automatically links what you're doing to something else, meaning that it becomes not just like this grade in this class, but it automatically, because you're thinking about more globally, your communication skills, your writing skills, um, your collaboration skills, it automatically leads you to look at how what you're doing now can help you in the future. Um, in sort of a, within this, it's just like part of the system. Um, does that help at all? Is that? <laughs> I think that's great. And I would love, um, Annie, would you mind talking a little bit about what you get when you get a report card? Yeah, totally. So uh, WMS, we're still working on switching from letter grades to competency based. So basically in class, you won't like see a letter grade while you're in class because we're grading on like a number, like a one to through seven scale. And on a report card, you'll still like, the final grade will be a letter grade, but it's like the numbers that add up to it that equal the letter grade, if that makes sense, through the competencies. And you'll also get a like effort grade for what you do in the class. So there's like honors, which is like just participating, um, in, engaging in the class and like doing all your work. And then there's like satisfactory, which is like a little bit under that. And then the one below that, I don't remember the name. Um, but yeah, I definitely, I like the way that we do the grading and the work because, you know, like working on a, trying to memorize a bunch of random facts for a test that you're not gonna remember in the next two days after taking it kind of seems like pointless. And I think our school definitely does a lot more like project-based work, which is really helpful because what Dino was saying, it doesn't only apply to what you're doing in the project or the work itself, it applies to outside the classroom. So I think it's really nice that we are using competency-based and that like projects sort of way over the rest of the work that we do. Thanks, Annie. And I got to I, I, I need to read something. Um, so I, I've just been reviewing faculty um, comments, um, grades and comments that are going to go out live. Students are going to get them on Monday. Um, and and I, I'm going to read an excerpt um, because I think what you're going to hear are two things. One, you're going to hear an amazing amount of student choice. And two, you're going to hear a, how, how incredibly well the teacher knows the student. Um, so this is from uh, this, um, this course, an English course that was looking at the 2019 book award winners. And it was trying to examine what was going on in the United States that would allow these to be the winner. So it was, it was kind of interrogating culture. Uh, and, and this teacher writes, um, for your exhibit of American culture, you opted to create a playlist of songs that represented the most pressing or persistent aspect of American culture, which for you was ego. What's most important to note here is that you began tracing the notion of ego from the outset of the course. You have notes on its place in American culture across all three te texts that we read, and it appeared in each of the major essays that you wrote. As we, keep, as we kept reading and learning, your understanding of ego shifted. You made concessions when you needed to, challenged the text or your peers when you needed to, and ultimately you arrived at an understanding of this cultural concept through a medium to which you most relate, music. What an incredibly beautiful way to learn. Wow, like talk about an amazing description of a student learning, um, how much that student had agency in their learning and how much that teacher was able to capture that and coach them and inspire them along the way. So, so that's, that's what you get when you come to the school. Thanks, Mike. And I'll add just uh, two sentences because people did ask about the outcomes that we are able to, that our students earn. Um, we have a director of college counseling through a lot of this student-driven work, um, students are able to um, not only access their potential, but also tell really compelling stories. Um, that allows students to draw upon a lot 
when they start to build their college applications. Um, and so, of course, we will go through the process with students and identify with them and with their families what is really important to them. But students have had practice curating a, a portfolio of their high school experience. Um, and if I juxtapose that with my high school experience um, where I just tried to take a couple AP classes and get good grades, um, I, I can only imagine what a, a reader of those two applications would think. Um, anyway, we do have a published list of our, our college matriculations as well. Um, Peter, can I interrupt one more time? Can can Jamie, Jamie, only because it was one of the most beautiful moments that I've been a part of as an educator. Can you describe what the presentation of learnings are? Uh, and can you give a little bit of an example of what, what happened during yours last year when it was a whole family experience? Um, yeah, uh, so last year we did this thing at the end of the year. It was um, our portfolio and we talked about like what we learned and what the competencies were. And so like one of the one of the competencies competencies that we learned last year that I really remember is like communication because it was like so important to me. Because um, before coming to the White Mountain School, I wasn't really like a I wasn't really someone who was open to like saying what I think because I thought I thought like people would judge me and all of that. But like also um, my my older school or my other school was very much focused on just grades and not really like um, opinions and different aspects of students. And so when I came here, I really learned to like open up more and talk about like what I think and how it, how it's important to me and how it like relates to each and every one of my experiences and how it relates to other people too. So that was like a very important like competency that I learned to develop over the year and I feel like it's worked well for me. And it's like, I'm still learning to develop it, to develop it, but I've come a long way from last year. Thanks so much, Jamie. Um, we've had a couple questions about academic support. The White Mountain School has a learning center um, and it is located physically in the heart of our, of our main building. Um, Oliver, would you mind talking a little bit about um, working with an academic coach and, um, and, and what resources are available? You've already talked about being able to find teachers when you need them, um, but what do you do when you need some help in class? Yeah, so the Learning Center, uh, there's a couple ways you can use that. Uh, one is you can actually take it as a class and it's sort of like a free block because you go in and you work either individually or in a small group with a learning coach who basically sits down and pulls up all of your work and what your teachers have been talking about. And they go over that with you and they help you through all of your work for the week. And it's a super awesome system. I used it for the first uh, two years I was here and it definitely helped me like get through all my work um, and like stay focused. Uh, another way is they have like open learning center time where you can go down and like get help from uh, one of the learning coaches um, if you're struggling on assignment. Uh, and yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's a super helpful system for getting through work if you need that. Awesome, thanks, Oliver. Um, and Kara, from a teacher's perspective, how are you able to um, use our academic coaches and our, our learning center to support um, your work with the students? Um, well, the coaches are in frequent uh, contact with the teachers. And so it'll happen even during that flex time. Some of my students will go to an academic coach during flex. Um, and it's really convenient because sometimes two of the biology students are together with one learning coach. And so, um, yeah, we'll have contact even during that particular lesson, ways that, that I can support them, ways that the coach can support them. And I also have to say what was already um, spoken of earlier is that the class sizes are just so small that 
like through a learning coach or through through the you know the teacher themselves i feel like students are really supported um yeah just by virtue of of having so much easily available interaction because the class is so small and because of these extended blocks of time that we have with our students thanks kara um we had a question come in about uh, extracurricular activities and specifically if a student is not interested in playing sports. Um, does anyone want to take a crack at that? I can. Um, so one of the extracurricular activities that we're offering this year is a social justice activity. Um, and, and the role of this activity was to get students together to think about what does it mean to be a social activist, especially in a time of, of the dig digital age where everybody is um, you know, tweeting and subtweeting and using Snapchat and all of these other modalities to, to express their, their opinions. And so thinking about the ways in which as a community, we can strike a balance between doing some like intentional online work around social justice and activism, but also the ways in which we can bring that educational piece to campus. And so we do everything from self-reflection to talking about um, how can we begin to talk about some of these issues here on campus, whether it's around appropriation or Black Lives Matter or other events that students are passionate about. And so this club really allows students to, to take the rein and to drive that conversation um, to talk about issues that they believe are most relevant to them, but also to, to the school community. Thanks, Matthew. We've had um, a Peter, can I jump? Go ahead. Of course. I'm, I'm helping out with Farm and Forest, um, which is another way that students who aren't necessarily um, athletically inclined or competitively inclined. We get outside each day and um, we're learning about agriculture and we're taking hikes through the forest. And it's just a great way for students to, to be out and working together and contribute. Wonderful. And we did have a question come up about, uh, about music. Um, Mike, would you mind talking about how that can incorporate into a variety of different areas at school? Sure, we have a state-of-the-art digital recording studio um, that is um, a really exciting place where students are, are making original music. Um, in terms of the courses that we offer, um, we have a, a band chorus, uh, we have a, um, a contemporary music seminar that teaches students about music theory and then introduces, um, and then they get into songwriting and then produce their songs in our recording studio. Uh, we have a, a course called Music Composition uh, where students, um, the, the sort of final piece is to create a, an original a uh, piece of, of um, music that is played live at the end of the semester by a quartet of professional musicians. Um, but what's really unique about this course is right from the very beginning, uh, each composer gets paired with a, with a professional composer um, who is part of the system and gets feedback weekly on their, on their original piece. Uh, and so the idea is how do we, um, how do we really introduce and, and, and modernize some of the, the, the focus on classical music. Um, and then, that's, that's like what's going on in the curriculum, but we also have a, a music group that, have, that meets during sports uh, and then a, a ton of musicians who are just constantly playing around campus. Uh, last Sunday, I was walking around, it was a beautiful fall day and, and saw a handful of students playing the guitar and ukulele and singing. And that's just um, part of the culture here. Thanks, Mike. Um, just as a forewarning, we're getting close to the end of our hour. So I'll take about three more questions. Um, and then we will try to follow up with any questions that haven't been answered tonight. So first of all, thank you for submitting so many, but um, we're gonna try and stick to the hour that we, that we have planned. Um, we have had a couple questions about what being a successful student at the White Mountain School is like. Um, I certainly believe that all the students on this panel are successful students. Uh, I try not to make them blush. Um, but Brian, from your perspective, when you look at you know, yourself in the mirror or your peers, what does it mean when a student is successful here? Yeah, so success can take many forms. Uh, it kind of really all just boils down to the student, how they want to make their experience here go. Uh, you can be 
outgoing in all of your classes like contribute to every discussion that there is uh but it really just kind of boils down to you if you want to be like the best on your team but or if you want to be all do all your homework in a certain amount of time it always you have your own set goals like you know what you want you don't have to be like every other student you can like choose your path and like the teacher's eyes it's not like oh the student always hands in their work they're successful it, it can take many forms that isn't just that it's like oh man they may not do all their homework but they're very good at driving a discussion forward in class and creating more thoughts and questions for students to have. So it really does take many forms. It all just depends on the student. So however you want success to be here in your years, uh, it just kind of, it's all up to you and your mentality of how you want to go about it. Thanks, Brian. And in that same vein, we did have a, a person write in, um, what is the typical postgraduate experience when the student leaves? Um, how have they incorporated the values and initiatives described here tonight um, into their, their lives after White Mountain? Um, Jamie, do you mind uh, talking a little bit about that? Maybe through anyone you know that's gone to the White Mountain School and graduated? Um, yeah. So basically I had like four of my siblings who came here and graduated and three of them went to St. Lawrence and one of them went to um, London. And um, I feel like through their experiences, they've learned to like um, open up a lot more and be like a lot more driven. So like they're um, especially active and like they always want to do things and then also not only like physical aspects but also like mentality they're always there to help each other and like um it's also like you get that kind of community feel through the siblings because they've been there and they know what it feels like so it's kind of like a little community of our own because we know what it feels like to be in a community Thanks so much, Jamie. Um, we are gonna take just one more uh, question. And I think it's a, a really nice one to end on. So I'm actually gonna, gonna ask everyone to, to go around and answer it um, because, uh, well, I'll read the question first. Um, the question is, um, describe the moment when you were like, yes, I definitely made the right decision. This is the place for me. Um, for students, obviously that's for being a student, but for the teachers on the call, for the faculty members, um, we all made choices to work here as well. Um, so maybe we'll go in the same order that we introduced ourselves. Annie, do you mind kicking it off? Of course. Um, last year, like I said, was my first year and definitely within like the first couple of weeks, I was like, did I make the right choice? Like leaving all my friends behind all this stuff. And right away, I definitely figured out that I did end up making the right choice because just the community and the learning here and just like living on campus and living with your friends is definitely a once in a lifetime experience that not a lot of people get to experience unless they go to college, I guess. But I think it's like boarding school is definitely a little more different, especially in a small, smaller community like ours. Um, and I definitely realized that with the amount of support that the teachers and faculty give and just how like student driven the classes are and how it's definitely learning more than you would in a regular class where the teacher talks at you for an hour instead of, being like more engaging and stuff was when I definitely realized that I made the right choice in my education. And not only that, it also teaches you how to, you learn a lot of different aspects when you live on in a boarding school. You definitely learn how to be independent and what it's like to live on your own and not have your mom do your laundry for you every day and stuff like that. So I think there's definitely a lot of benefits to it that I quickly learned last year. And I definitely made me realize that this was the right choice for me. Thanks, Annie. Kara? Um, I, I think I've just had several moments where I experienced this beautiful sense of community that many of the panelists have already referred to. Um, I mean, it just keeps happening over and over, but one instance in particular, um, one of the new sophomores, I believe, who I don't even teach, like he's not in my dorm and he's not in a class with me, but like you get to know so many different students. There are just so many opportunities to meet the students here. And he's he really loves to act and he just decided he wanted to put on 
uh, murder mystery theater and like initiated the whole thing himself. And it was just a crazy success. The students were so excited to be part of it. Students in all grade levels with all these different interests and just the sense of the students coming together for this activity and the student who organized it, his, his sense of pride in it, just witnessing that whole experience was a moment where I thought this is definitely the right school for me. Thanks, Kara. Oliver? Yeah, I feel like the first moment for me was probably community weekend, the first weekend of freshman year, where we all got together and competed uh, as light blue versus dark blue in a bunch of fun events. Um, and it really just like made me feel like welcomed here. And like, I just knew right then that like, yeah, I made the right choice coming here. And I'm also like constantly reminded that this is the right place for me, like almost every day, like I'll just go outside and like see how like beautiful it is here. Or like I'll like during the winter, like I'll go on Hood's Hill and like go skiing whenever I want. And like, it's just an amazing place. Like, and I'm constantly reminded of, the, reminded of that. Thanks, Oliver. Matthew? Yeah, I think my moment would, would come even before I got to this community. Um, so in a conversation about classes, I was told that when designing my classes, um, to, to make them engaging, to make them fun, to make them student-centered, bring in some social justice lenses, and also try and do some project-based stuff. And I was like, okay, like this is a lot, <laughs> but also super exciting and awesome that I have autonomy over this. And so I remember the day that I proposed to Mike that I actually wanted to do a um, class on world building through a lens of social justice in order to have students solve real world issues. Like I was ready for like pushback and defend and like had all my textbooks ready. And Mike was like, no, I trust you. Right, like I trust you. This sounds awesome. It's choice. We have we give our teachers autonomy here. Um, so go for it. And like that moment of just knowing that my colleagues in an admin trusted me as as a teacher here and knew what I was doing and and trusted that I had my students' interests um, in in mind. Uh, that that was the moment that solidified it for me. Thanks, Matthew. Jamie. Um, definitely, it wasn't my first moment, but like one moment where I was really sure was the end of the year last year. So like Mike mentioned earlier about my portfolio, I put a lot of like, um, I put a lot of emphasis on my grades and um, looking back to what I did last year was like a very powerful moment for me because of all that I accomplished. And um, also when coming back to the school, I felt like it was where I needed to be this year especially after the long break from school, seven months away from school. And it was so refreshing to be here in the mountains and be with like all of my friends again. Thanks, Jamie. Dinah? Yeah, so um, one moment that sort of stands out for me is um, my first year here for um, family weekend, which was just mid-October that year. Um, I had an introduction to choreography class um, and they were interested in presenting something um, to their families who were visiting and to other students and so we basically presented um, a project that we had worked on in the course and it was a little bit of a last minute addition to the schedule but the studio was just chock full of parents and students and um, my students were able to come forward and really um, clearly talk about what they had created and why they had created it and present it and um, just that moment of so much uh, creativity and intention coming together in one place was kind of sealed things for me and made me sure that it was um, the right place to be. Thanks, Dinah. Brian? Yeah, so same, similar to Oliver, my the moment I fell in love with WMS uh, was community weekend my freshman year. And it just like, there was this whole tradition of just dark blue versus light blue. And I was like, you'd never find this at any other school. And so to see that there are two separate groups is just like astonishing. We go to all these activities and just play games to see who wins. But by the end of the day, you all know that you're just one big community. You're, you're just a family. 
and like no matter what you always have something someone or a group of people to rely on for support or just to kind of navigate you in the right uh, in the right direction and so it's just that that moment where i see everyone gathering around cook circle uh getting into their teams and going off into activities is just jaw dropping to, to know that i'm finally here and like this is real this is happening this is where i'm going to spend the rest of my three years here and that was like the moment where i really found that i love this place and i really want to stay thanks brian how about you mike um so many things that i could choose i mean matthew i could say that conversation I had with you and just hearing how inspiring uh, and creative your ideas are, or Kara, when uh, you had a student who wanted to go snorkel out in the pond so they could work on their ecology project, or Diana, the choreography project that your students did remotely that was so beautiful and brilliant, or Oliver riding at Kingdom Trails in that first orientation trip three years ago, um, that was so wonderful. Jamie sitting down with your presentation of learning with your family as you shared all of the artifacts that you had pulled together from the year. Brian, seeing how excited and motivated you were when you came back from the SDLC, the Student Diversity Leadership Conference, uh, or Annie on our field course uh, when we spent a week living on an island learning about improvisation and music. I mean, those were all things I could draw on, but I'm going to talk about a specific moment um, different from that where I was teaching a design class and I had a senior in the class who had never done any computer programming uh, and she was like I'm, I'm going to take this class and it, it felt risky uh, and and she took this class and in the first day she came with this ambitious project of wanting to have a um, build a fan that would respond to temperature because she said it got hot in her room and she wanted to have a fan when it got a certain temperature to turn on uh, and so I was like well that's pretty sophisticated stuff but she said I mean I want to do this and so she tackled this hard project uh, and she worked through all the code and got the code working and then she had to work through um, all the circuitry and got that working and then she needed to build a fan so she had to learn how to do 3D printing in her iLab and built a little model and all of a sudden she had an operating uh, fan that would at 70 degrees would turn on and when she came back the next day and after doing homework and when it turned on when it got warm in the room she was like I did that um this student came back the next year uh, after being in college and she said Mike you'll never never believe this but I decided to be a computer science major it was because of that moment um and there are so few girls so few women uh, in my in the CS department that I've started a, a club for all female identifying students um, and I think that moment of just bravery uh, and, and, and agency and then taking really control of one's learning is such a clear picture of why this place is, is a magical place to live and to learn and to be in community. Thanks so much, Mike. Thank you to all of our attendees. Uh, I know we're a little bit over the hour mark. Um, I appreciate you staying on and, and listening to um, the experiences of all our amazing people. Hopefully it gave you a, a really clear picture of how our program um, intersects with, with the people that we have here. I'll turn it over to Allison for some closing remarks and here you go. Thanks, that's a tough act to follow. Um, I'm so inspired by all of you, my colleagues and our students. And um, I, I hope that they've only reinforced for all of you, our guests, that you are choosing so much more than a school. This is so much more than a school. This is an, incre an incredible opportunity ahead that includes relationships, communities, and opportunities to be stretched and supported in ways that, that, are, that you don't even know about yet. Um, and you have an opportunity to be presented with, um, with um, exposure to new things um and the, and support from incredible peers and faculty members um so a huge thanks to our community and our panelists for joining us this evening thank you and a huge thanks to all of our guests who have um who have stayed with us tonight to learn more about the white mountain school um in terms of next steps we encourage you to schedule a visit um, as I mentioned earlier, we are um, fortunate to be doing in-person learning due to our low rates of infection in the area and being in rural New Hampshire. So if you are able to travel to the school, we are accepting visitors on campus. Um, we do have a set of guidelines that we have to follow for having folks on campus, but we're excited to be hosting visitors. So please reach out. 
Um, if you're unable to visit campus, no worries. We have created a robust virtual visit experience for you. Um, but no matter how you engage with the White Mountain School, I can promise you one thing, and that is that we will connect you with our people because they are what makes this place so special and such a compelling option for our students and their families. Um, so please be in touch. We in the, in the admissions office and throughout the entire school are so eager to get to know you and work with you and, and help you and guide you through this process. So um, thanks again for letting us run a little bit over time. Huge thanks to my colleagues and our students and all of our guests on tonight. Uh, we look forward to being in touch with you soon. Thank you.